The Leo Frank Trial Closing Arguments, Solicitor Dorsey We now present the final closing arguments by Solicitor Hugh Dorsey in the trial of Leo Frank for the murder of Mary Fagan. A powerful summary of the case and a persuasive argument that played a large part in the decision of the jury to find Frank guilty of the crime. It is also riveting reading for modern readers who have been told, quite falsely, that the case against Frank was a weak one, and told, equally falsely, that anti-Semitism was a major motive for the arrest, trial, and conviction of Frank. Quote, The Solicitor General for the State, Mr. Dorsey. Gentlemen of the Jury, This case is not only as his honor has told you, important. But it is extraordinary. It is extraordinary as a crime, a most heinous crime. A crime of a demoniac. A crime that has demanded vigorous, earnest, and conscientious effort on the part of your detectives, and which demands honest, earnest, conscientious consideration on your part. It is extraordinary because of the prominence, learning, ability, standing of counsel pitted against me. It is extraordinary because of the defendant. It is extraordinary in the manner in which the gentlemen argue it, in the methods they have pursued in its management. They have had two of the ablest lawyers in the country. They have had Rosser, the rider of the winds and the stir of the storm, and Arnold and I can say it because I love him, as mild a man as ever cut a throat or scuttled a ship. They have abused me. They have abused the detective department. They have heaped so much calumny on me that the mother of the defendant was constrained to arise in their presence and denounce me as a dog. Well, there's an old adage, and it's true, that says... When did any thief ever feel the halter draw with any good opinion of the law? Oh, prejudice and perjury. They say that is what this case is built on, and they use that stereotyped phrase until it fatigues the mind to think about it. Don't let this purchased indignation disturb you. Oh, they ought to have been indignant. They were paid to play the part. Gentlemen, do you think that these detectives and I were controlled by prejudice in this case? Would we, the sworn officers of the law, have sought to hang this man on account of his race and pass over the Negro, Jim Conley? Was it prejudice when we arrested Gant? When we arrested Lee? When we arrested others? No. The prejudice came when we arrested this man, and never until he was arrested was there a cry of prejudice. Those gentlemen over there were disappointed when we did not pitch our case along that line. But not a word emanated from this side, showing any prejudice on our part, showing any feeling against Jew or Gentile. We would not have dared to come into this presence and ask the conviction of a man because he was a Gentile, a Jew, or a Negro. Oh, no two men ever had any greater pleasure shown on their faces than did Mr. Arnold and Mr. Rosser when they started to question Kendley and began to get before the court something about prejudice against the Jews. They seized with avidity the suggestion that Frank was a Jew. Remember, they put it before this court, and we did not. The word Jew never escaped our lips. I say that the race this man comes from is as good as ours. His forefathers were civilized and living in cities and following laws when ours were roaming at large in the forest and eating human flesh. I say his race is just as good as ours, but no better. I honor the race that produced Disraeli, the greatest of British statesmen, that produced Judah P. Benjamin, as great a lawyer as England or America ever saw. 
I honor the Strauss brothers. I roomed with one of his race at college. One of my partners is of his race. I served on the board of trustees of Grady Hospital with Mr. Hirsch, and I know others, too many to count. But when Lieutenant Becker wished to make away with his enemies, he sought men of this man's race. Then you will recall Abe Hummel, the rascally lawyer, and Roof, another scoundrel, and Schwartz, who killed a little girl in New York, and scores of others. And you will find that this great race is as amenable to the same laws as any others of the white race or as the black race is. They rise to heights sublime, but they also sink to the lowest depths of degradation. We don't ask a conviction of this man except in conformity with the law which his honor will give you in charge. His honor will charge you that you should not convict this man unless you think he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A great many jurors, gentlemen, and the people generally get an idea that there is something mysterious and unfathomable about this reasonable doubt proposition. It's as plain as the nose on your face. The text writers and lawyers and judges go around in a circle when they undertake to define it. It's a thing that speaks for itself, and every man of common sense knows what it is, and it isn't susceptible of any definition. One text writer says a man who undertakes to define it uses tautology. The same words over again. Just remember, gentlemen of the jury, that it is no abstruse proposition. It is not a proposition way over and above your head. It's just a common sense, an ordinary, everyday, practical question. In the 83rd Georgia, one of our judges defines it thus. A reasonable doubt is one that is opposed to an unreasonable doubt. It is one for which a reason can be given, and it is one that is based on reason, and it is such a doubt that leaves the mind in an uncertain and wavering condition, where it is impossible to say with reason nor certainty that the accused is guilty. If you have a doubt, it must be such a doubt as to control and decide your conduct in the highest and most important affairs of life. It isn't, gentlemen, as is said in the case of John v. State in 33rd Georgia, a vague conjectural doubt or a mere guess that possibly the accused may not be guilty. It isn't that. It must be such a doubt as a sensible, honest-minded man would reasonably entertain in an honest investigation after truth. It must not be, as they say, in the case of Butler v. State, 92 Georgia, a doubt conjured up. Or, as they say in the 83 Georgia, a doubt which might be conjured up to acquit a friend. It must not be, as they say in the 63 Georgia, a fanciful doubt, a trivial supposition, a bare possibility of innocence. That won't do, that won't do. It doesn't mean the doubt, they say in 90 Georgia, of a crank or a man with an oversensitive nature, but practical common sense is the standard. Conviction can be established as well upon circumstantial evidence as upon direct evidence. Eminent authority shows that, in many cases, circumstantial evidence is more certain than direct evidence. Conviction can be established better by a large number of witnesses giving circumstantial evidence and incidents pointing to guilt than by the testimony of a few witnesses who may have been eyewitnesses to the actual deed. In this case, we have both circumstantial evidence and admission. Hence, with reasonable doubt as a basis, the evidence shows such a consistency that a reasonable conclusion is all that is needed. This thing of a reasonable doubt originated long ago, 
when the accused was not allowed to be represented by counsel to defend him. In time, the reasonable doubt will drop out. Our people are getting better and better about this all the time. The state is handicapped in all sorts of ways by this reasonable doubt proposition, and has to do more than prove a man's guilt often before a conviction can result. You can't get at a verdict by mathematics, but you can get at it by a moral certainty. People sometimes say that they will not convict on circumstantial evidence. That is the merest bosh. Authorities show that circumstantial evidence is the best evidence. People are improving about this. Yet juries are often reticent upon this point. But juries should not hesitate at lack of positive evidence. The almost unerring indication of circumstantial evidence should control. Otherwise, society is exposed to freedom in the commission of all sorts of the most horrible crimes. Circumstances which would warrant a mere conjecture of guilt are not warranted as the basis for a conviction. But when the evidence is consistent with all the facts in the case, only a conviction can result. End quote. Mr. Dorsey there told the graphic story of how W.H.T. Durant, upon circumstantial evidence, was convicted of the murder of Blanche Lamont in Emanuel Baptist Church in San Francisco. Quote, Now, let's examine this question of good character. I grant you, good character spells a whole lot. But first, Let's establish good character. It is presumed, had he not put his character in issue, it would have been presumed, and the state would have been absolutely helpless, that this man was as good a man as lived in the city of Atlanta. It's a mighty easy thing, if a man is worth anything, if a man attains to any degree of respectability, it's a mighty easy thing to get someone to sustain his character but it's the hardest thing known to a lawyer to get people to impeach the character of another. In the Durant case, his character was unimpeached. The defendant here put his character in issue, and we accepted the challenge. And we met it, I submit to you. Now, if we concede that this defendant, in this case, was a man of good character, a thing we don't concede, Still, under your oath and under the law that his honor will give you in charge, as is laid down in the 88 Georgia, page 92, proof of good character will not hinder conviction if the guilt of the defendant is plainly proved to the satisfaction of the jury. First, you have got to have the good character before it weighs a feather in the balance. And remember that the hardest burden, so far as proof is concerned, that ever rests on anybody, is to break down the character of a man who really has character. And I ask you if this defendant stands before you, a man of good character? Mr. Arnold, as though he had not realized the force of the evidence here against the man who, on April 26th, snuffed out the life of little Mary Fagan, in his desperation, stood up in this presence and called nineteen or twenty of these reputable, high-toned girls, though they be working girls, crack-brain fanatics and liars, and they have hurled that word around here a good deal, too. They have hurled that word around here a good deal. If that's an attribute of great men and great lawyers, I hear and now proclaim to you I have no aspirations to attain them. Not once will I say that anybody has lied, but I'll put it up to you as twelve honest, conscientious men by your verdict to say where the truth lies and who has lied. I'm going to be satisfied with your verdict, too. I know this case, and I know the conscience that abides in the breast of honest, courageous men. Now, 
the book says that if a man has good character, nevertheless, it will not hinder conviction. If the guilt of the defendant is plainly proved to the satisfaction of the jury, as it was in the Durant case, and I submit that, character or no character, this evidence demands a conviction. And I'm not asking you for it either because of prejudice. I'm coming to the perjury after a bit. Have I so forgotten myself that I would ask you to convict that man if the evidence demanded that Jim Conley's neck be broken? Now, Mr. Arnold said yesterday, and I noticed it, though it wasn't in evidence, that Jim Conley wasn't indicted. No, he will never be for this crime because there is no evidence. He's an accessory after the fact, according to his own admission, and he's guilty of that and nothing more. And I'm here to tell you that, unless there's some other evidence besides that which has been shown here or heretofore, you've got to get you another Solicitor General before I'll ask any jury to hang him. Lousy Negro, though he may be, and if that be treason, make the most of it. I have got my own conscience to keep, and I wouldn't rest quite so well to feel that I had been instrumental in putting a rope around the neck of Jim Conley for a crime that Leo M. Frank committed. You do it, too. I want you to bear in mind, now, we haven't touched the body of this case. We have been just clearing up the underbrush. We'll get to the big timber after a while. Where character is put in issue, and the state can't do it, it rests with him. Where character is put in issue, the direct examination must relate to the general reputation, good or bad. That is, whoever puts character in issue can ask the question with reference to the general reputation, good or bad, as the case may be. But on cross-examination, particular transactions or statements of single individuals may be brought into the inquiry in testing the extent and foundation of the witness's knowledge and the correctness of his testimony on direct examination. We did exercise that right in the examination of one witness, but knowing that we couldn't put specific instances in unless they drew it out, I didn't want even to do this man the injustice. So we suspended, and we put it before this jury in this kind of position. You put his character in. We put up witnesses to disprove it. You could cross-examine every one of them and ask them what they knew and what they had heard and what they had seen. We had already given them enough instances, but they didn't dare. They didn't dare to do it. Mark you now, here's the law. Where character is put in issue, the direct examination must relate to the general reputation. We couldn't go further, but on cross-examination, when we put up these little girls, sweet and tender, ah, uh, but particular instances or statements of single individuals you could have brought into the inquiry. But you dared not do it. You tell me that the testimony of these good people living out on Washington Street, the good people connected with the Hebrew Orphans Home, Dr. Marks, Dr. Sun, you tell me that they know the character of Leo M. Frank as these girls do, who have worked there but are not now under the influence of the National Pencil Company and its employees? Do you tell me that if you are accused of a crime, or I am accused of a crime, and your character or my character is put in issue, that if I were mean enough to do it, or if Messrs. Starnes and Campbell were corrupt enough to do it, that you could get others who would do your bidding? I tell you, in principle and common sense, it is a dastardly suggestion. You know it, and I know you know it, 
and you listen to your conscience, and it will tell you you know it. And you have got no doubt about it. The trouble about this business is, throughout the length and breadth of our land, there's too much shenanigans and too little honest, plain dealings. Let's be fair. Let's be honest. Let's be courageous. Tell me that old Pat Campbell or John Starnes or Mr. Rosser, in whose veins, he says, there flows the same blood as flows in the attorney's veins, that they could go and get 19 or 20 of them, through prejudice and passion, to come up here and swear that that man's character is bad. And it not be true. I tell you, it can't be done, and you know it. Ah, uh, but, on the other hand, Dr. Marx, Dr. Sun, all these other people, as Mr. Hooper said, who run with Dr. Jekyll, don't know the character of Mr. Hyde. And he didn't call Dr. Marx down to the factory on Saturday evenings to show what he was going to do with those girls. But the girls know. Now, gentlemen, put yourself in this man's place. If you are a man of good character, and 20 people come in here and state that you are of bad character, your counsel have got the right to ask them who they ever heard talking about you and what they ever heard said and what they ever saw. Is it possible? I'll ask you in the name of common sense that you would permit your counsel to sit mute? You wouldn't do it, would you? If a man says that I am a person of bad character, I want to know. Curiosity makes me want to know. And if it's proclaimed, published to the world, and it's a lie, I want to nail the lie to show that he never saw it and never heard it and knows nothing about it. And yet, three able counsel and an innocent man and twenty or more girls, all of whom had worked in the factory, but none of whom work there at this time, except one on the fourth floor, tell you that that man had a bad character, and had a bad character for lasciviousness. The uncontrolled and uncontrollable passion that led him on to kill poor Mary Fagan. This book says it is allowable to cross-examine a witness, to see and find out what he knows, who told him those things. And I'm here to tell you that this thing of itself is pregnant, pregnant, pregnant with significance, and does not comport with innocence on the part of any man. We furnished him the names of some. Well, even by their own witnesses, it looks to me there was a leak and little Miss Jackson dropped it out just as easy. Now, what business did this man have going in up there, peering in on those little girls? The head of the factory, the man that wanted flirting forbidden. What business did he have going up into those dressing rooms? To tell me to go up there to the girl's dressing room, shove open the door, and walk in as a part of his duty, when he has four ladies to stop it? No, indeed. And old Jim Conley may not have been so far wrong as you may think. He says that somebody went up there that worked on the fourth floor. He didn't know who. This man, according to the evidence of people that I submit you will believe, notwithstanding the fact that Mr. Reuben B. Arnold said it was a lie, and called them harebrained fanatics. According to the testimony even of a lady who works there now, and yet is brave enough and courageous enough to come down here and tell you that that man had been in a room with a lady that works on the fourth floor. And it may have been that he was then, when he went in there on this little Jackson girl and the Mayfield girl and Miss Kitchens. 
looking out to see if the way was clear to take her in again. And Miss Jackson, their witness, says she heard about his going in there three or four times more than she ever saw it, and they complained to the four ladies. It may have been right then and there he went to see some woman on the fourth floor that old Jim Conley says he saw go up there to meet him Saturday evening. When all these good people were out on Washington Street and Montauk's, and the pencil factory employees even, didn't know of the occurrence of these things. August 23rd, Mr. Dorsey. I was just about concluding yesterday what I had to say in reference to the matter of character, and I think that I demonstrated by the law to any fair-minded man that this defendant has not a good character. The conduct of counsel in this case, as I stated, in failing to cross-examine, in refusing to cross-examine these 20 young ladies, refutes effectively and absolutely the claims of this defendant that he has good character. As I said, if this man had had a good character, no power on earth could have kept him and his counsel from asking those girls where they got their information and why it was they said that this defendant was a man of bad character. I have already shown you that under the law, they had the right to go into that character, and you saw that on cross-examination, they dared not do it. I have here an authority that puts it right squarely, that whenever anyone has evidence, 83 Georgia, 581, in their possession, and they fail to produce it, the strongest presumption arises that it would be hurtful if they had, and their failure to produce evidence is a circumstance against them. You don't need any law book to make you know that that's true, because your common sense tells you that whenever a man can bring evidence, and you know that he has got it and don't do it, the strongest presumption arises against him. And you know, as twelve honest men seeking to get at the truth, that the reason these able counsel didn't ask those hair-brained fanatics, as Mr. Arnold called them, before they had ever gone on the stand, girls whose appearance is as good as any they brought, girls that you know by their manner on the stand, spoke the truth. Girls who are unimpeached and unimpeachable was because they dared not do it. You know it. If it had never been put in a law book, you'd know it. And then you tell me that because these good people from Washington Street come down here and say that they never heard anything, that he is a man of good character. Many a man has gone through life, and even his wife and his best friends never knew his character. And someone has said that it takes the valet to really know the character of a man. And I had rather believe that these poor, unprotected working girls, who have no interest in this case, and are not under the influence of the pencil company or Montauk or anybody else, know that man, as many a man has been heretofore, is of bad character, than to believe the rabbi of his church and the members of the Hebrew orphan's home. Sometimes, you know, a man of bad character uses charitable and religious organizations to cover up the defects. And sometimes a consciousness in the heart of a man will make him overactive in some other line in order to cover up and mislead the public generally. Many a man has been a wolf in sheep's clothing. Many a man has walked in high society and appeared on the outside as a whited sepulchre, who was as rotten on the inside as it was possible to be. So he has got no good character, I submit, never had it. He has got a reputation. That's what people say and think about you. And he has got a reputation for good conduct only among those people that don't know his character. But suppose that he had a good character. That would amount to nothing. 
David of old was a great character, until he put old Uriah in the forefront of battle in order that he might be killed. That Uriah might be killed, and David take his wife. Judas Iscariot was a good character, and one of the twelve, until he took the thirty pieces of silver and betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Benedict Arnold was brave, enjoyed the confidence of all the people and those in charge of the management of the Revolutionary War, until he betrayed his country. Since that day, his name has been a synonym for infamy. Oscar Wilde, an Irish knight, a literary man, brilliant, the author of works that will go down the ages. Lady Windermere's fan, D. Profundus, which he wrote while confined in jail. A man who had the effrontery and the boldness. When the Marquis of Queensbury saw that there was something wrong between this intellectual giant and his son, sought to break up their companionship, he sued the Marquis for damages, which brought retaliation on the part of the Marquis for criminal practices on the part of Wilde, this intellectual giant. And wherever the English language is read, the effrontery, the boldness, the coolness of this man, Oscar Wilde, as he stood the cross-examination of the ablest lawyers of England, an effrontery that is characteristic of the man of his type, that examination will remain the subject matter of study for lawyers and for people who are interested in the type of pervert like this man. Not even Oscar Wilde's wife, for he was married and had two children, suspected that he was guilty of such immoral practices. And, as I say, it never would have been brought to light, probably, because, committed in secret, had not this man had the effrontery and the boldness and the impudence himself to start the proceeding which culminated in sending him to prison for three long years. He's the man who led the aesthetic movement. He was a scholar, a literary man, cool, calm, and cultured. And as I say, his cross-examination is a thing to be read with admiration by all lawyers. But he was convicted, and in his old age, went tottering to the grave, a confessed pervert. Good character? Why, he came to America after having launched what is known as the aesthetic movement in England, and throughout this country lectured to large audiences, and it is he who raised the sunflower from a weed to the dignity of a flower. Handsome, not lacking in physical or moral courage, and yet a pervert, but a man of previous good character. Abe Roof of San Francisco, a man of his race and religion, was the boss of the town, respected and honored, but he corrupted Schmidt, and he corrupted everything that he put his hands on, and just as a life of immorality a life of sin, a life in which he fooled the good people when debauching the poor girls with whom he came in contact has brought this man before this jury. So did eventually Roof's career terminate in the penitentiary. I have already referred to Durant. Look at McHugh, the mayor of Charlottesville, a man of such reputation that the people elevated him to the head of that municipality. But notwithstanding that good reputation, he didn't have a rock-bed character, and, becoming tired of his wife, he shot her in the bathtub. And the jury of gallant and noble and courageous Virginia gentlemen, notwithstanding his good character, sent him to a felon's grave. Richardson, of Boston, was a preacher who enjoyed the confidence of his flock, he was engaged to one of the wealthiest and most fascinating women in Boston, but an entanglement with a poor little girl, of whom he wished to rid himself, caused this man Richardson to so far forget his character and reputation and his career as to put her to death. And all these are cases of circumstantial evidence. And after conviction, after he had fought, 
He at last admitted it, in the hope that the governor would at least save his life. But he didn't do it. And the Massachusetts jury and the Massachusetts governor were courageous enough to let that man who had taken that poor girl's life to save his reputation as the pastor of his flock go. And it is an illustration that will encourage and stimulate every right-thinking man to do his duty. Then there's Beattie. Henry Clay Beattie of Richmond. Of splendid family. A wealthy family. Proved good character. Though he didn't possess it. Took his wife, the mother of a 12-month-old baby, out automobiling, and shot her. Yet that man, looking at the blood in the automobile, joked, joked, joked. He was cool and calm, but he joked too much. And although the detectives were abused and maligned, and slush funds to save him from the gallows were used in his defense, a courageous jury, an honest jury, a Virginia jury measured up to the requirements of the hour and sent him to his death, thus putting old Virginia and her citizenship on a high plane. And he never did confess, but left a note to be read after he was dead, saying that he was guilty. Crippen, of England, a doctor, a man of high standing, recognized ability, and good reputation, killed his wife because of infatuation for another woman, and put her remains away where he thought, as this man thought, that it would never be discovered. But murder will out, and he was discovered, and he was tried, and be it said to the glory of old England, he was executed. But you say you've got an alibi. Now, Let's examine that proposition a little bit. An alibi. Section 1018 defines what an alibi is. An alibi, as a defense, involves the impossibility. Mark that. Of the prisoner's presence at the scene of the offense at the time of its commission. An alibi involves the impossibility and the range of evidence must be such as reasonably to exclude the possibility of guilt. And the burden of carrying that alibi is on this defendant. It involves the impossibility. They must show to you that it was impossible for this man to have been at the scene of that crime. The burden is on them. An alibi gentlemen of the jury, while the very best kind of defense, if properly sustained, is absolutely worthless. I'm going to show you in a minute that this alibi is worse than no defense at all. I want to read you a definition that an old darky gave of an alibi, which I think illustrates the idea. Rastus asked his companion, What's this here alibi you don't hear so much talk about? And old Sam says, An alibi is proving that you was at the prayer meeting where you wasn't to show that you wasn't at the crap game where you was. Now, right here. Let me interpolate. This man never made an admission. From the beginning until the end of this case, except he knew that someone could fasten it on him. Wherever he knew that people knew he was in the factory, he admitted it, all right. But you prove an alibi by that little Karen's girl, do you? She swore that she saw you at Alabama and Broad at 110. And yet, here is the paper containing your admission, made in the presence of your attorney, Monday morning, April 28th, that you didn't leave the factory until 1.10. Gentlemen, talk to me about sad spectacles, but of all the sad spectacles that I have witnessed throughout this case, I don't know who did it, 
I don't know who's responsible. And I hope that I'll go to my grave in ignorance of who it was that brought this little Karen's girl, the daughter of a man that works for Montag, into this case, to prove this alibi for this red-handed murderer. Who killed that little girl to protect his reputation among the people of his own race and religion. Jurors are sworn, and his honor will charge you. You have got the right to take into consideration the deportment, the manner, the bearing, the reasonableness of what any witness swears to. And if any man in this courthouse, any honest man, seeking to get at the truth, looked at that little girl, her manner, her bearing, her attitude, her actions, her connections with Montag, and don't know that she, like that little Bower boy, had been riding in Montag's automobile? I am at a loss to understand your mental operations. But if Frank locked the factory door at ten minutes past one, if that be true, how in the name of goodness did she ever see him at Alabama and Broad at one ten? Mark you, she had never seen him but one time. Had never seen him but one time and with the people up there on the street to see the parade, waiting for her companions. This daughter of an employee of Montag comes into this presence and tells you the unreasonable, absurd story. The story that's in contradiction to the story made by Frank which has been introduced in evidence, and will be out with you, that she saw that fellow up there at Jacob's. On this time proposition, I want to read you this. It made a wonderful impression on me when I read it. It's the wonderful speech of a wonderful man, a lawyer to whom even such men as Messrs. Arnold and Rosser, as good as the country affords, as good men and as good lawyers as they are, had they stood in his presence, would have pulled off their hats in admiration for his intellect and his character. I refer to Daniel Webster, and I quote from Webster's great speech in the Knapp case. Time is identical. Its subdivisions are all alike. No man knows one day from another, or one hour from another, but by some fact connected with it. Days and hours are not visible to the senses, nor to be apprehended and distinguished by understanding. He who speaks of the date, the minute, and the hour of occurrences, with nothing to guide his recollection, speaks at random. That's put better than I could have put it. That's put tersely, concisely, logically, and it's the truth. Now, what else about this alibi, this chronological table here, moved up and down to save a few minutes? The evidence, as old Sig Montag warned me not to do, twisted, yea, I'll say contorted, warped, in order to sustain this man in his claim of an alibi. For instance, they got it down here, Frank arrived at the factory, according to Holloway, Alonzo Mann, Roy Irby, at 8.25. That's getting it down some, ain't it? Frank says he arrived at 8.30. Old Jim Conley, perjured, lousy, and dirty, says that he arrived there at 8.30 and he arrived carrying a raincoat. And they tried mightily to make it appear that Frank didn't have a raincoat, that he borrowed one from his brother-in-law, but Mrs. Ersenbach says that Frank had one. And if the truth were known, I venture the assertion that the reason Frank borrowed Ersenbach's raincoat on Sunday was because, after the murder of this girl on Saturday, he forgot to get the raincoat that old Jim saw him have. Miss Maddie Smith leaves building, you say, at 9.20 a.m. She said, or Frank says, at 
you have it on this chart here that's turned to the wall that Frank telephoned Schiff to come to his office at 10 o'clock. And yet this man, Frank, coolly, composedly, with his great capacity for figures and data, in his own statement, says that he gets to Montauk's at that hour. And you've got the records. Trot them out, if I'm wrong. At 11 a.m., Frank returns to the pencil factory. Holloway and Mann come to the office. Frank dictates mail and acknowledges letters. Frank, in his statement, says 11.05. Anyway, oh Lord, any hour, any minute, move them up and move them down. We've got to have the alibi. Like old Uncle Remus's rabbit, we're just obliged to climb. 12.12. Approximate time Mary Fagan arrives. Frank says that Mary Fagan arrived 10 or 15 minutes after Miss Hall left. And with mathematical accuracy, you've got Miss Hall leaving the factory at 12.03. Why, I never saw so many watches so many clocks or so many people who seem to have had their minds centered on time, as in this case. Why, if people in real life were really as accurate as you gentlemen seek to have us believe, I tell you, this would be a glorious old world, and no person and no train would ever be behind time. It doesn't happen that way, though. But to crown it all, in this table, which is now turned to the wall, you have Lemmy Quinn arriving. Not on the minute, but to serve your purposes, from 1220 to 1222. But that, gentlemen, conflicts with the evidence of Freeman and the other young lady who placed Quinn by their evidence in the factory before that time. End quote. Quote, Mr. Arnold. There isn't a word of evidence to that effect. Those ladies were there at 11.35 and left at 11.45. Corinthia Hall and Miss Freeman, they left there at 11.45, and it was after they had eaten lunch and about to pay their fare before they ever saw Quinn at the little cafe, The Busy Bee. He says that they saw Quinn over at the factory before 12, as I understood it. End quote. Quote, Mr. Dorsey. Yes, sir, by his evidence. End quote. Quote, Mr. Arnold. That's absolutely incorrect. They never saw Quinn there then and never swore they did. End quote. Quote, Mr. Dorsey. No, they didn't see him there. I doubt if anybody else saw him there either. End quote. Quote, Mr. Arnold. If a crowd of people here laugh every time we say anything, how are we to hear the court? He has made a whole lot of little misstatements, but I let those pass. But I'm going to interrupt him on every substantial one he makes. End quote. Quote, Mr. Dorsey. He says those ladies saw Quinn. Says they saw Quinn was there before 12 and before I left there at 1 o'clock. You saw him at that, did you? Yes, sir. Now, you are sure he did that? Yes, sir. You are positive he did that? Yes, sir. And then Mr. Arnold comes in with his suggestion, and she takes the bait and runs under the bank. He saw how it cut. Then I came back at her again. Now, just to show how she turned a turtle. You did see Frank working Saturday morning on the financial sheet? No, he didn't work on the financial sheet. Why did you state a moment ago you saw him working on it? 
No, sir, I didn't. My lord. Gentlemen, are you going to take that kind of stuff? I know she is a woman, and I'd hesitate except I had the paper here in my hand to make this charge. But if you, as honest men, are going to let the people of Georgia and Fulton County and of Atlanta suffer one of its innocent girls to go to her death at the hands of a man like this, and then turn him loose on such evidence as this? Then I say it's time to quit going through the farce of summoning a jury to try him. If I had the standing, the ability and the power of either Messrs. Arnold or Rosser to ring that into your ears and drive it home, you would almost write a verdict of guilty before you left your box. Perjury! Perjury! When did old John Starnes and Pat Campbell, from the Emerald Isle, or Rosser, ever fall so low that, when they can convict a Negro? Easy, because he wouldn't have Arnold and Rosser, but just my friend, Bill Smith. And for what reason do they want to let Jim go and go after this man, Frank? Why didn't they take Newt Lee? Why didn't they take Gant? The best reason in the world is that they had only cobwebs. Cobwebs. Weak and flimsy circumstances against those men. And the circumstances were inconsistent with the theory of guilt and consistent with some other hypothesis. But as to this man, you have got cables. Strong so strong that even the ability, the combined ability, of the erudite Arnold and the dynamic Rosser couldn't break them or disturb them. Circumstantial evidence is just as good as any other kind, when it's the right kind. It's a poor case of circumstantial evidence against Newt Lee. It's no case against that long-legged Gant from the hills of Cobb. But against this man, oh, a perfect, a perfect case. And you stood up here and dealt in generalities as to perjury and corruption. It isn't worth a cent unless you put your finger on the specific instances. And here it is in black and white, committed in the presence of this jury, after he had already said that he wrote the financial sheet Saturday morning and at your suggestion, he turned around and swore to the contrary. Yet my friend Schiff says, No, I take that back. Schiff says, with the stenographer gone, with Frank behind in his work, that he went home and slept all day and didn't get up what he called the data. Well, he's a Joe Darter. That's what Schiff is. It never happened. It never happened. With that financial sheet that Saturday morning. But if it did, it wouldn't prove anything. He may have the nerve of an Oscar Wilde. He may have been cool when nobody was there to accuse him. And it isn't at all improbable if he didn't have the data in the morning. For him to have sat there and deliberately written that financial sheet. Do you tell me that Frank, when the factory closed at 12 o'clock Saturdays, with as charming a wife as he possesses, with baseball, the college graduate, the head of the Binet Brith, the man who loved to play cards and mix with friends, would spend his Saturday afternoons using this data that Schiff got up for him, when he could do it Saturday morning? No, sir. Miss Fleming told the truth up until that time. I didn't stay there very often on Saturday afternoon. Miss Fleming didn't stay there all afternoon. Now, gentlemen, I submit this man made that financial sheet Saturday morning. He could have fixed up that financial sheet Saturday afternoon, but he wouldn't have done it without Schiff having furnished the data if he hadn't been suspecting an accusation of murdering that little girl. A man of Frank's type could easily have fixed that financial sheet, a thing he did 52 times a year for five or six years. 
and could have betrayed no nervousness. He might easily, as he did when he wrote for the police, in the handwriting, a thing that he was accustomed to do, even in the presence of the police. You'll have it out with you. He may have written so as not to betray his nervousness. You've been listening to our continuing audiobook series featuring the best writing from the American Mercury on the Leo Frank case. Be with us next time when we'll continue with the next installment of the American Mercury on Leo Frank. And speaking about perjury. There's a writing that his mother said anybody who knew his writing ought to be able to identify And yet, that man you put up there to prove Frank's writing was so afraid that he would do this man some injury that he wouldn't identify the writing that his mother says that anybody that knows it at all could recognize. I grant you that he didn't betray nervousness, probably, in the bosom of his family. I grant you that he could fix up a financial sheet that he had been fixing up 52 times a year for five or six years and not betray nervousness. I grant you that he could unlock the safe, a thing that he did every day for 365 days in the year without betraying nervousness. But when he went to run the elevator, when he went to nail up the door, when he talked to the police, when he rode to the station, then he showed nervousness. And he could sit in a hall and read and joke about the baseball umpire, but his frivolity that annoyed the people Saturday night that they had the card game was the same kind of frivolity that Beatty betrayed when he stood at the automobile that contained the blood of his wife that he had shot. And certainly it is before this jury that he went in laughing and joking and trying to read a story that resulted only in annoyance to the people that were in that card game. But whether or not he made out that financial sheet I'll tell you something that he did do Saturday afternoon when he was waiting up there for old Jim to come back to burn that body. I'll tell you something that he did do. And don't forget the envelope, and don't forget the way that that paper was folded either. Don't forget it. Listen to this. I trust this finds you and dear Taunt, that's the German for aunt, well after arriving safe in New York. I hope you found all the dear ones well in Brooklyn. Didn't have any wealthy people in Brooklyn, eh? This uncle of his was mighty near Brooklyn. The very time old Jim says he looked up and said, I have wealthy people in Brooklyn. And I would really like to know, I would like to see how much that brother-in-law that runs that cigar business has invested in that store and how much he has got. The very letter that you wrote on Saturday, the 26th, shows that you anticipated that this old gentleman, whom everybody says has got money, was then, you supposed, in Brooklyn. Because here you say that, I hope you have found all the dear ones well. But I'm coming back to what Frank said to old Jim, and I await a letter from you telling me how you found things there in Brooklyn. Lucille and I are well. Now, here is a sentence that is pregnant with significance, which bears the earmarks of the guilty conscience, tremulous as he wrote it. No, he could shut his eyes and write and make up a financial sheet. He's capable and smart, wonderfully endowed intellectually, But here's a sentence that, if I know human nature and know the conduct of the guilty conscience, and whatever you may say about whether or not he prepared the financial sheet on Saturday morning, here's a document, I'll concede, was written when he knew that the body of little Mary Fagan, who died for virtue's sake, lay in the dark recesses of that basement. It is too short a time, he says, since you left for anything startling to have developed down here. Too short, too short, startling, but too short a time. 
and that itself shows that the dastardly deed was done in an incredibly short time. And do you tell me, honest men, fair men, courageous men, true Georgians, seeking to do your duty, that that phrase, penned by that man to his uncle on Saturday afternoon, didn't come from a conscience that was its own accuser? It is too short a time since you left for anything startling to have developed down here. What do you think of that? And then listen at this. As if that old gentleman, his uncle, cared anything for this proposition. This old millionaire traveling abroad to Germany for his health. This man from Brooklyn. An eminent authority says that unusual, unnecessary, unexpected, and extravagant expressions are always earmarks of fraud. And do you tell me that this old gentleman, expecting to sail for Europe, the man who wanted the price list and financial sheet, cared anything for those old heroes in gray? And isn't this sentence itself significant? Today was Yontif, holiday. Here, and the thin gray lines of veterans here braved the rather chilly weather to do honor to their fallen comrades. And this from Leo M. Frank, the statistician, to the old man, the millionaire, or nearly so, who cared so little about the thin gray line of veterans, but who cared all for how much money had been gotten in by the pencil factory. Too short a time for anything startling to have happened down here since you left. But there was something startling, and it happened within the space of 30 minutes. There is nothing new in the factory to report. Ah, there was something new, and there was something startling, and the time was not too short. You can take that letter and read it for yourself. You tell me that letter was written in the morning. Do you believe it? I tell you that that letter shows on its face that something startling had happened, and that there was something new in the factory, and I tell you that that rich uncle, then supposed to be with his kindred in Brooklyn, didn't care a flip of his finger about the thin gray line of veterans. His people lived in Brooklyn. That's one thing dead sure and certain, and old Jim never would have known it, except Leo M. Frank had told him. And they had at least $20,000 in cold cash out on interest. And the brother-in-law, the owner of a store employing two or three people, and we don't know how many more. And if the uncle wasn't in Brooklyn, he was so near there too that even Frank himself thought he was at the very moment he claimed he was there, because he says... You have seen or are with the people in Brooklyn. All right. Let's go a step further. On April 28th, he wired Adolf Montag in care of the Imperial Hotel. Listen now to what he says. You may have read in Atlanta papers of Factory Girl found dead Sunday morning. In Factory? In Factory? No. In cellar. Cellar where? Cellar of pencil factory. There's where he placed her. There's where he expected her to be found. And the thing welled up in his mind to such an extent that Monday morning, April 28th, before he had ever been arrested, he wires Montag forestalling what he knew would surely and certainly come unless the Atlanta detectives were corrupted and should suppress it. You have read in Atlanta papers of factory girl found dead Sunday morning in cellar of pencil factory. Police will eventually solve it. He didn't have any doubt about it. Police will eventually solve it. And be it said to their credit, they did. Assure my uncle, he says Monday morning, 
I am all right, in case he asks. Our company has case well in hand. Girl found dead in pencil factory cellar, he says in the telegram. The police will eventually solve it, he says before he was arrested. I am all right, in case my uncle asks. And our company has the case well in hand. Well, maybe he did think that when he got that fellow Scott, that he had it well in hand. I'll tell you, there's an honest man. If there was a slush fund in this case, these witnesses here say they don't know anything about it, but if there was a slush fund in this case, Scott could have got it, because, at first, he never heard any words that sounded better to him than when Scott said, We travel arm in arm with the police. That's exactly what Frank wanted them to do at that time. He wanted somebody that would run with Black and Starnes and Rosser, and it sounded good to him, and he said, all right. He didn't want him to run anywhere else because he wanted him to work hand in glove with these men, and he wanted to know what they did and what they said and what they thought. But Haas, and he's nobody's fool, when he saw that they were getting hot on the trail, opened up the conversation with the suggestion that now you let us have what you get first. And if Scott had fallen for that suggestion, then there would have been something else. You know it. You tell me that letter and that telegram are not significant. I tell you that this evidence shows, notwithstanding what Joe Darter Schiff swore, when he saw the necessity to meet this evidence of Miss Fleming, which Mr. Arnold tried so hard, because he saw the force of it, to turn into another channel, that Frank didn't fix that financial sheet Saturday morning. I say that, with the stenographer gone and Frank behind, and Schiff had never done such a thing before, he had always stuck to him in getting it up before, that what Gant told you is the truth. This man, expert, brilliant, talk about this expert accountant, Joel Hunter. Why, he isn't near as smart as this man, Frank, to begin on. And besides, the idea of his going up there and taking up those things and trying to institute a comparison as to how long it would take him, even if he had the capacity of Frank, he hasn't got it. To go up there and do those things, why, it's worse than ridiculous. And Frank himself wasn't satisfied with all this showing about what he had done. He got up on the stand. He saw the weakness of his case. And he's as smart as either one of his lawyers, too, let me tell you. And I'll bet you he wrote that statement, too. They may have read it, but he wrote it. Frank realized that he must go over and beyond what the evidence was. And through his statement, he sought to lug into this case something that they didn't have any evidence for. Why? because he knew in his heart that all this talk about the length of time it took to fix that financial sheet was mere buncombe. Then he seeks to put in here through that statement, and if we hadn't stopped him, he would have done it, a whole raft of other stuff that Schiff, as willing as he was, as anxious as he was, couldn't stultify himself to such an extent as to tell you that Frank did that work Saturday morning. But if he did write that financial sheet Saturday afternoon, a thing I submit he didn't do, I'm willing to admit he wrote that letter. I ask you, as fair men and honest men and disinterested jurors representing the people of this community in seeing that justice is done and that the man who committed that dastardly deed has meted out to him that which he meted out to this poor little girl, if this documentary evidence, these papers, don't have the impress of a guilty man. You know it. All right. But you say there's perjury. Where is it? I'll tell you another case. I have already referred to it. It's when that man, put up there to identify Frank's writing, failed to identify a writing that Frank's own mother swore that anybody that knew anything about his writing could have identified. There's perjury there, when Roy Bauer swore with such minute particularity as to his visits to that factory. 
There's perjury when this man, Lee, says that Duffy held his finger out and just let that blood spurt. But that ain't all. Here's the evidence of Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson says she has worked in that factory three years. And Mr. Arnold, in that suave manner of his, without any evidence to support it, not under oath, says, Mrs. Carson, I'll ask you a question I wouldn't ask a younger woman. Have you ever at any time around the ladies' dressing room seen any blood spots? And she said, I certainly have. That's a ridiculous proposition on its face. Have you seen that on several occasions or not? I've seen it three or four times. Not in three years. But now, did you ever have any conversation with Jim Conley? And she says, yes. On Tuesday, he came around to sweep around my table. That's exactly where Jim says he was Tuesday morning before this man was arrested. What floor do you work on? Fourth. What floor do your daughters work on? On the fourth. Did you see him up there Monday morning? No, sir. That's Frank. Tuesday morning? I saw him Tuesday morning. He was up there on the fourth floor after the murder on Tuesday. Sometime between 9 and 11 o'clock. I said, between 9 and 11, somewhere along there. Sometime between 9 and 11.30. Now, Jim Conley and Leo M. Frank were both on your floor between the same hours? I saw Mr. Frank and I saw Jim Conley. You know it because you had a conversation with Mr. Frank and you had a conversation with Jim Conley? Yes, I saw them both. And Conley says, and surely Conley couldn't have been put up to it by these men, even if they had wanted to suborn perjury, that when Frank came up there Tuesday morning before he was arrested, it was then that he came to him and leaned over and said, Jim, be a good boy. And then Jim, remembering the money and remembering the wealthy people in Brooklyn and the promises that Frank made, says, Yes, I is. Tuesday morning, says Mrs. Carson, your witness. Jim Conley and Frank both were on that floor, and Jim was doing exactly what he said he was doing, sweeping. Now, let's see this. This old lady was very much interested. Now, did you go on the office floor to see that blood? Listen at this. What blood? The blood right there by the dressing room. What dressing room? What blood are you talking about? She had seen it three or four times all over the factory? On the second floor? No, sir. She says, I never did see that spot. Never saw it at all? No, I didn't care to look at nothing like that. You don't care to look at nothing like that? No, sir, I don't. Now, that's Mrs. Carson, the mother of Miss Rebecca. That's what she told you under oath when she was on the stand. Now, let's see about perjury. Now, mark you, I'm not getting up here and saying this generally without putting my finger on the specific instances, and I'm not nearly exhausting the record. You can follow it up. But I am just picking out a few instances. Here's what Mrs. Small says about Jim Conley reading the newspapers. Well, if Jim had committed that crime, and he hadn't felt that he had the power and influence of Leo Frank back of him to protect him, he never would have gone back there to that factory or sat around and read newspapers, and you know it, if you know anything about the character of the Negro. Why was he so anxious to get the newspapers? 
It was because Jim knew some of the facts that he wanted to see, Negro-like. That's what made him so anxious about it. Here Mr. Arnold comes. You are a lady that works on the fourth floor, and I'm going to ask you a question that we are going to ask every lady that works on that fourth floor. And we caught them out on that proposition, too, didn't we? And you don't know right now how many women that worked on that floor were put up and how many weren't. You've got the books and the records, and you could have called the names, and you didn't dare do it. And after you had gone ahead and four-flushed before this jury as to what you were going to do, we picked out Miss Kitchens and brought her here, and she corroborated your own witness, Miss Jackson, as to the misconduct of this superintendent, Frank. Now, let's see what Mrs. Small says. Mrs. Small is a lady that got the raise, you remember, and couldn't tell what date it was, thought it had been about four months ago. She got a five-cent raise. About four months ago would make it since this murder, and when I got to quizzing her about it, she didn't know when she got the raise, and she's not the only one that got the raise, and it wasn't only in the factory that they raised them, either. Even Manola McKnight got some raise, and after she saw the import of it, you don't remember the exact date. No, sir, I don't. When she had already placed the date subsequent to this murder. And this woman, Mrs. Small, also corroborates Jim Conley about being up there Tuesday. Did you see Mr. Frank up there any of those days? I saw Mr. Frank up there Tuesday after that time. What time Tuesday? I couldn't tell you. I guess it was between 8 and 9 o'clock. The other one saw him somewhere between 9 and 11 or 11.30. This lady, their witness, says that he was up there between 8 and 9. Why was Frank so anxious to go up there on that floor? Why? It was because he wanted to see this man, Jim Conley, that he thought was going to protect him. Mr. Rosser characterized my suggestion that this man Frank called upon and expected Jim Conley to conceal the crime as a dirty suggestion. And I accept it as absolutely true, and I go a step further and say it was not only dirty, it was infamous. And he would today sit here in this courthouse and see a jury of honest men put a rope around Jim Conley's neck, the man that was brought into it by him, and he didn't mean to bring Jim Conley in unless he had to. And he had to. Jim says the first question he asked him when he saw him down there after this dastardly crime had been committed was, Have you seen anybody go up? Yes, says Jim. I have seen two girls go up, but I haven't seen but one come down. And then it was that this man saw the absolute necessity of taking Jim into his confidence, because he knew that Jim was on the lookout for him. And Starnes and Campbell and Black combined, together. And even if you make a composite intellect and add the brilliance of Messrs. Rosser and Arnold to that of these detectives, could never have fitted that piece of mosaic into the situation. It isn't to be done. Jim, have you seen anybody go up? Yes, said Jim. I see two girls go up, but only one came down. And you told Jim to protect you, and Jim tried to do it, and the suggestion was dirty. And worse than that, it is infamous. To be willing to see Jim Conley hung for a crime that Leo Frank committed. But I'm coming to that after a while. I haven't got to the state's case yet. I'm just cutting away some of the underbrush that you have tried to plant in this forest of gigantic oaks to smother up their growth. But you can't do it. The facts are too firmly and too deeply rooted. Oh yes, says Mrs. Small. I saw Frank up there on that fourth floor between eight and nine o'clock Tuesday morning. And the other lady saw him up there between nine and 11. She wouldn't be sure the day he was arrested. I say arrested, according to Frank's own statement himself, 
They got him and just detained him. And even then, red-handed murderer as he was, his standing and influence, and the standing and influence of his attorney, somehow or other. And that's the only thing to the discredit of the police department throughout the whole thing, say what you may. They were intimidated and afraid because of the influence that was back of him, to consign him to a cell like they did Lee and Conley. And it took them a little time to arrive at the point where they had the nerve and courage to face the situation and put him where he ought to be. Now, I'll tell you another thing, too. If old John Black, and Mr. Rosser didn't get such a great triumph out of him as he would have us believe, either. Black's methods are somewhat like Rosser's methods, and if Black had Rosser where Rosser had Black, or if Black had Rosser down at police station, Black would get Rosser. And if Black had been given an opportunity to go after this man, Leo M. Frank, like he went after that poor defenseless Negro, Newt Lee, towards whom you would have directed suspicion, this trial might have been obviated, and a confession might have been obtained. You didn't get your lawyer to sustain you and support you a moment too soon. You called for Darley, and you called for Haas, and you called for Rosser, and you called for Arnold, and it took the combined efforts of all of them to keep up your nerve. And I don't want to misquote, and I won't misquote, but I want to drive it home with all the power that I possibly can or that I possess. The only thing in this case that can be said to the discredit of the police department of the city of Atlanta is that you treated this man, who snuffed out that little girl's life on the second floor of that pencil factory, with too much consideration. And you let able counsel and the glamour that surrounds wealth and influence deter you. I honor, but I honor the way they went after Manola McKnight. I don't know whether they want me to apologize for them or not. But if you think that finding the red-handed murderer of a little girl like this is a lady's tea party, and that the detectives should have the manners of a dancing master and apologize and palaver, you don't know anything about the business. You have seen these dogs that hunt the possum bark up a tree or in a stump, and when they once get the scent of the possum, you can do what you like, but they'll bark up that tree and they'll bark in that stump until they run him out. And so with old John Starnes and Campbell. They knew, and you know, that Albert McKnight would never have told Craven this tale about what he saw and what his wife had told him, except for the fact that it be true. And if you had been Starnes, you would have been barking up that tree or barking in that stump until you ran out what you knew was in there. That's all there is to it. You have got the writ of habeas corpus that's guaranteed to you. Go and get it. And if Mr. Haas had come to me Tuesday morning and said, You direct the police. On Monday morning, when Frank was taken down into custody and said to me, You direct the police to turn this man Frank loose. He's innocent. I would have said, It's none of my business. I run my office. They run their office. And the next time the police department, in an effort to serve the people of this community, take a Negro that they know and you know and lock her up or whatnot, I'll not usurp the functions of the judge of these courts who can turn her loose on a habeas corpus and direct them to turn her loose or interfere in any way in their business. I don't run the police department of the city of Atlanta. I run the office of solicitor general for the term that the people have elected me. And I'm taken to task because I went in at the beginning of this thing and didn't stand back. I honor Mr. Hill. I am as proud of having succeeded him as I am that I was elected to the position by the people of this community, to the office of Solicitor General, but I have never yet seen the man that I would take as my model or pattern. I follow the dictates of my own conscience, and if there is one act since I have been Solicitor General of which I am proud, it is the fact that I joined hand and glove with the detectives in the effort to seek the murderer of Mary Fagan. And when your influence poured letters into the grand jury in an effort to hang an innocent man, Negro though he be, that I stood firmly up against it. 
If that be treason, make the best of it. And if you don't want me to do it, then get somebody else to fill the job. And the quicker you do it, the better it will suit me. I will not pattern myself after anybody or anybody's method, not even Mr. Hill, and bless his old soul. He was grand and great, and I have wished a hundred times that he was here today to make the speech that I'm now making. There wouldn't be hair or hide left on you. He was as noble as any Roman that ever lived, as courageous as Julius Caesar, and as eloquent as Demosthenes. Such talk as that don't scare me, don't terrify me, don't disturb the serenity of my conscience, which approves of everything that I have done in the prosecution of this man. Now, let's come back here and discuss this thing of perjury. Let's talk about that a little. Let's not get up here and say that everybody is a liar without citing any instances, and that they are crack brain fanatics. Let's knuckle down and get specific instances. So this Mrs. Small says she saw Jim Conley. Did you see Mr. Frank up there on any of those days? I saw Mr. Frank after that crime on Tuesday. What time Tuesday? I couldn't tell you. I guess between 8 and 9 o'clock. He and Miss Carson were coming up from the back end of the factory. Miss Rebecca, I presume. He and Mrs. Carson were coming up from the back end of the factory, and I stepped up in front of him and I said, Here, Mr. Frank, wait a moment. Okay this ticket. He says, Are you going to put me to work as soon as I get here? And I says, Yes, it's good for your health. He okayed the ticket, and I went on with my work. So Frank was up there Tuesday morning. Now, speaking about Mrs. Carson, how far towards the elevator did Mrs. Carson go with Frank? Mrs. Carson wasn't up there. It was Miss Carson, Miss Rebecca. The old lady says she was. I said, oh, the old lady wasn't up there at all. No, sir, she wasn't there Tuesday at all. You saw Miss Rebecca Carson walking up towards the elevator. Yes, sir. What was Conley doing? Standing there by the elevator. And yet, Jim has lied about Frank. Frank was up there twice. Jim was sweeping. Jim was there by the elevator. At the time you saw Frank, the Negro was standing there at the elevator? Yes, sir. He wasn't sweeping. He was standing there with his hand on the truck looking around. Did he see you and Frank? I guess he must have seen us. Where was Conley when he went down the steps? Standing in front of the elevator. How close did Frank pass Conley? As close as from here to that table, about four feet. Conley was still standing there with his hand on that thing. Is that true? Yes, sir. That's exactly like Conley says. And here's another thing. This woman, Mrs. Small, testifies about that elevator. It shakes the whole building, I said. Anybody in the world could tell it if the machinery wasn't running. She says, No, anybody in the world could tell it if the machinery wasn't running, but you can't notice it unless you are close to the elevator. I asked, if there was hammering and knocking, would you still hear the elevator? She said, you could if you get close to it. Well, of course you could. Nobody disputes that. If the elevator was up here and you were back in the rear and there was hammering and knocking going on, you couldn't. No, sir. And that disposes of that point that's the truth on that. Now, Mrs. Carson had already sworn here positively that she didn't go down to see that blood, hasn't she? There were too many of these people over there at the factory who had seen that blood. That blood that at first wasn't blood, it was paint, and then wasn't paint but was cat's blood, or blood from somebody that was injured, 
and then wasn't fresh blood, but was stale blood. Too many of them had seen it. On Wednesday, I had no business back there. I was there one day, but can't remember. What did you go back there for? A crowd of us went at noon to see if we could see any blood spots. Were you successful? No, sir. Who went with you? And lo and behold, Mrs. Carson, the mother of Rebecca, had already stated that she didn't go about it. The very first person that this Mrs. Small refers to. Well, Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson went with you, I said. Yes, sir. She saw the places where the blood was said to be. You know she was there. You are pretty sure she was there. Mrs. Small said, Yes, sir. It looked like what? Looked like powder. How much of it down there? A small amount, just a little, looked like some of the girls had been powdering their face and spilled powder. You know better than that. I came back to the subject. What makes you say Mrs. Carson went down there with you? Answer. Because curiosity sent us down there. Did curiosity send her down there too? We went back afterwards. Now, gentlemen, somebody swore. And I put it up to you too. Somebody committed perjury. You were going back yourself and went to get her? Yes, sir. She didn't make any objection to going down, did she? No, sir. Don't you know she didn't go? I know, she says, that she did. All right. If this case is founded on perjury, it's the kettle calling the pot black, and I haven't dealt in glittering generalities. I have set forth specific cases. But that isn't intended to be exhaustive. That's a mere summary of a few of these instances. They are too numerous to mention. The truth is that there is no phase of this case where evidence was needed to bolster it up that somebody hasn't come in, you say, willingly and without pay, because you say there is no slush fund back of this case. Now, let's pass on here a little bit. They tried mighty hard to break down this man, Albert McKnight, with Manola. And I believe I'll leave that for a little later and come now to the statement of Frank's. Gentlemen, I wish I could travel faster over this. I'm doing the very best I can. I have a difficult task, and I wish I didn't have to do it at all. Now, gentlemen, I want to discuss briefly right here these letters. And if these letters weren't the order of an all-ruling providence, I should agree with my friends that they are the silliest pieces of stuff ever practiced. But these letters have intrinsic marks of a knowledge of this transaction. These pads. That pad. Things usually found in his office. This man Frank, by the language of these notes, in attempting to fasten the crime upon another, has indelibly fixed it upon himself. I repeat it. These notes, which were intended to fix the crime upon another, have indelibly fixed it upon this defendant, Leo M. Frank. The pad, the paper, the fact that he wanted a note. You tell me that ever a Negro lived on the face of the earth who, after having killed and robbed or ravished and murdered a girl down in that dark basement, or down there in that area, would have taken up the time to have written these notes, and written them on a scratch pad, which is a thing that usually stays in the office, or written them on paper like this, found right outside of the office of Frank, as shown on that diagram, which is introduced in evidence and which you will have out with you? You tell me that that man, Jim Conley, sober, 
as Tillander and Graham tell you, when they went there, would have ravished this girl with a knowledge of the fact that Frank was in that house? I tell you no. Do you tell me that this man, Jim Conley, drunk as a fiddler's bitch, if you want it that way, would or could have taken time to have written these notes to put beside the body of that dead girl? I tell you no, and you don't need me to tell you, you know it. The fact, gentlemen of the jury, that these notes were written. Ah, but you say that it's foolish. You say it's foolish. It's ridiculous. It was a silly piece of business. It was a great folly. But murder will out, and Providence directs things in a mysterious way. And not only that, as Judge Bleckley says, crime, whenever committed, is a mistake in itself. And what kind of logic is it that will say that a man committed a crime, which is a great big mistake, and then in an effort to cover it up, won't make a smaller mistake? There's no logic in that position. The man who commits a crime makes a mistake. And the man who seeks to cover it up nearly always makes also a little mistake. And this man here, by these notes, purporting to have been written by little Mary Fagan, by the verbiage and the language and the context, in trying to fasten it on another, as sure as you are sitting in this jury box, has indelibly fastened it on himself. These gentlemen saw the significance of the difference between Scott's evidence when he was before the coroner, and he wasn't quizzed there particularly about it. I told her no, and I told her I didn't know. To tell that little girl no would have given her no excuse, according to their way of thinking, to go back to see whether that metal had come or not but to tell her I didn't know would lure her back into the snare where she met her death. And your own detective, Scott, says, after he gave the thing mature deliberation, that this man on the Monday evening, and he was so anxious about getting a detective that he had that man shift telephone three times, three times, three times, three times. Remember that. So anxious was he. Scott says, after thinking over the matter, that Leo M. Frank told that girl that he didn't know whether the medal had come or not, and she went back there to see about the medal, and he followed her back there. I'll tell you another thing, that old Starnes and Campbell and Rosser, and even Newport Lanford, if he had been called in, and even if I had been called in to save my life, could not have known that the very word that Leo M. Frank used... According to Jim Conley, when Conley says Frank told him, I'm going to chat with a girl, would have been used exactly four times, as I'll show you when I come to read this statement by Leo M. Frank, for he chatted and he chatted and he chatted and he chatted, according to his own statement. This letter that I hold in my hand says that this Negro did it. Old Jim Conley in his statement here, which I hold in my hand, every time he opened his mouth says, I done it. Old Jim Conley, if he had written these notes, never would have said, this Negro did it by himself. But Frank wanted it understood that the man that did do it, did it by himself. Jim Conley says that Frank says he wanted to chat. And four times in this statement, before they suspended to go out and let you refresh yourself, this man Frank had said that somebody came in the office to chat. And Mr. Arnold, in making his argument to the jury, realized, because he is as keen and as smart as they ever get to be, the force of that word, and endeavor to parry the blow which I now seek to give this defendant. And you tell me that old Jim Conley, after he had robbed and murdered, 
or after he had ravished and murdered this girl, when he would have had no occasion in the world to have cared whether her dead body was found right there at that chute, was such a fool as to take the time to take her body way back there in the basement and hide it behind the corner of that room. I tell you that it never occurred. That body was taken down there and put in the place where it was. Why? Because she was murdered on the second floor where the blood spots are found and because Leo M. Frank, the superintendent of the plant, saw and felt the necessity that that girl's body should not be found on the second floor of the pencil factory. But to use the language which he put in the letter or telegram which he sent to Adolf Montag in New York, in the cellar. My, my. That Negro fireman down here did this. Now, let's see how many times Jim says, done it. I lock the door like he done told me. I remembers that because the man, what was with the baby, looked at me like he thought I done it. That's when they ran into the man that Jim says looked at him like he thought I done it. It's the difference between ignorance and education. And these notes that you had that man prepare in your office on this paper that stayed on that floor and on that pad that came from your office, bear the marks of your diction, and Starnes and Campbell, with all their ingenuity, couldn't have anticipated that old Jim would get up here and state that, this man looked at me when he ran into that baby, like I done it, and couldn't have made him say, I locked the door like he done told me, and couldn't have said, I went on and walked up to Mr. Frank and told him that girl was done dead. He done just like this and said, Shh. I could go on with other instances. And there's your word chat. Chat, chat, chat. Four times. I'm going to read it to you. It's here in black and white, and you can't get around it. This girl went down there in that scuttle hole? Listen at this. You didn't want to say that she went back there to see about the metal, but you knew that the lady's water closet was back there. And you make this poor girl say, I went to make water. I went to make water. He pushed me down that hole, a long, tall, black Negro. Long, slim, tall Negro. I write while he play with me. And this note says that long, tall, black Negro did it by himself. Make water? Where did she go to make water? Right back there in the same direction that she would have gone to see about the metal. You tell me, except providentially, that that would have crept in here? You tell me that old Jim Conley, Negro, after he had struck that girl with that big stick, which is a plant as sure as you are living here and as sure as Newt Lee's shirt was a plant, you tell me that Negro felt any inducement or necessity for leaving that girl's form anywhere except where he hit her and knocked her down. You tell me that he had the ingenuity and mark you, Starnes and these other men weren't there then to dictate and map out. You tell me that he would write a note that she went back to make water when there's no place and her usual place was up there on the second floor? I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that a smarter man than Starnes, or a smarter man than Campbell, a smarter man than Black, a smarter man than Rosser, in the person of Leo M. Frank, felt impelled to put there these letters, which he thought would exculpate him, but which incriminate and damn him in the minds of every man seeking to get at the truth. Yet, you tell me there's nothing in circumstantial evidence. When here's a pad, 
and there's the pad, and there's the notes, which you must admit, or which you don't deny, old Jim Conley wrote, because you say in your statement you had got numerous notes from him. And yet, the very day, at the police station, according to your own statement, when you wrote that, you saw the original of these, and you didn't open your mouth, you didn't say a word, you didn't direct the finger of suspicion against this man, Jim Conley, who had been infamously directed to keep quiet to protect you. Things don't happen that way, gentlemen, and you know it. There isn't an honest man on that jury, unbiased, unprejudiced, seeking to get at the truth, but what knows that these letters... Silly? Yes, silly. Except you see the hand of providence in it all. That don't know that the language and the context and the material out of which they are written were written for the protection of Leo M. Frank, the superintendent of this factory, who wired Montag to tell his uncle, If my uncle inquires about me, state that I am all right. The police have the thing well in hand and will eventually solve the problem. And the girl was found dead, not in the factory, but in the cellar. The man who wrote the note. Nothing startling has happened in so short a time. Wrote it with a knowledge and conscience of the fact that this poor girl's life had been snuffed out even at the time he penned the words. You'll have this out with you. You look at them. If you can get anything else out of them, you do it. And as honest men, I don't want you to convict this man unless you are satisfied of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But don't let that doubt be the doubt of a crank. Don't let it be the doubt of a man who has conjured it up simply to acquit a friend. Or a man that has been the friend of a friend. Let it be the doubt of an honest, conscientious, upright juror, the noblest work of Almighty God. Now this statement. I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that when this statement you heard Frank make is scanned, it is susceptible of but one construction, and that is that it is the statement of a guilty man, made to fit in these general circumstances as they would have you believe. These gentlemen here harped a great deal, gentlemen of the jury. Are you going to convict him on this? Are you going to convict him on that? It isn't the law that circumstantial evidence is inferior to direct and positive evidence, and it is correct to instruct the jury that there is nothing in the nature of circumstantial evidence that renders it less reliable than other classes of evidence. The illustration that they would seek gentlemen of the jury, not by direct language did they do it in their argument to you, because we had already read them this authority. But they would bring up this isolated fact, and that isolated fact, and they would say, are you going to convict him on that? I don't ask your conviction on that. Two illustrations. First, each of the incidental facts surrounding the main fact and issue is a link in a chain, and that the chain is not stronger than its weakest link. This authority says is generally rejected as an incorrect metaphor and liable to misconstruction. The second illustration, and the one that is approved is, each of the incidental facts surrounding the main facts and issue are compared to the strands in a rope, where none of them may be sufficient in itself but all taken together may be strong enough to establish the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt. And so they took isolated instance after isolated instance and then said, are you going to convict him on that? I say no. But I do say that these instances each constitute a chain or a cord, a strand and a cable, and that when you get them all, all together, 
You have a cable that ought to hang anybody. That's the proposition. Not on this isolated instance, or that one, but upon all, taken together and bound together, which make a cable as strong as it is possible for the ingenuity of man to weave around anybody. Now, listen at this statement, and let's analyze that as we go on a little. I don't know whether this man's statement to the jury will rank along with the cross-examination of that celebrated pervert, Oscar Wilde, or not. But it was a brilliant statement, when unanalyzed, and if you just simply shut your eyes and mind to reason, and take this statement, then, of course, you are not going to convict. But listen to what our courts say about these statements. I have already read it to you, but I want to read it again. Evidence given by a witness has inherent strength which even a jury cannot, under all circumstances, disregard. A statement has none. No cross-examination, no oath, merely a statement, adroitly prepared to meet the exigencies of the case. You've been listening to our continuing audiobook series featuring the best writing from the American Mercury on the Leo Frank case. Be with us next time when we'll continue with the next installment of the American Mercury on Leo Frank.